Welcome back to Workshop Friend and part four of working on this collet chuck for my course to student lathe. When I started the video I had in mind just uh, the need to make a link and uh, mount the chuck on the lathe and use it but as time has gone on I realized there's a little more to this than I first realized. So in the last video I indicated that um, maybe I need to actually service the chuck itself. It's always interesting to take apart mechanisms like this and have a closer look. So here's the main body uh, with the taper that goes on the head on the mantra of the lathe and uh, basically it consists of a, a honed accurate location diameter here and a sleeve that fits in there Probably the most crucial part of this is this uh, tapered sleeve, which as you've seen is a really nice fit in here. So this taper here corresponds with the taper on the, on the collet. And basically what happens is this tapered sleeve is pushed up against the end cap and that compresses the collet against these quite powerful springs. And that's what gives you action. So clearly um, this is a, a very important component. So on the rear of the sleeve is another taper and that taper interacts with nine balls which are distributed around the circumference. And uh, those balls are pushed inwards and as they're pushed inwards it pushes the sleeve forward. And hopefully evenly um, with all nine balls acting at the same time. So there's some critical dimensions there. So let's try and get this sleeve back in again, squarely. Tried this several times and it's actually more difficult than it looks. It falls out when you don't want it to fall out, but when you push it in, it sometimes, unless you get it bang on square, it doesn't want to go. Right. So the nine balls go around the circumference like that. And you can see as that moves back, the balls come out. Conversely, as the balls are pushed in radially, the sleeve moves forward, interacts with the collet and the end cap, which is adjustable. Now, the other key part of this is this sleeve, which fits on this way around. Now, this is keyed on here, stop it from rotating, but it enables it to slide. Now the first thing I notice about this is that it's not such a close fit as the other components and it seems to me that is intended to float somewhat and I, my assumption here is that it's intended to float over the center line determined by the nine balls. So in a sense its concentricity is not coming from this, but it's coming from the inner, inner assembly. This should go over. There. Now, as we, as we move the sleeve up, there, it moves, it pulls the collar up. But there's some mechanical advantage there. So, uh, quite a lot of movement of this, sort of, I think it's about 0.4 of an inch. Um, results in a very small movement on this so a little bit of clever design there but um, there's a lot here that uh, that could go wrong so what I'm going to do is um, take this over to the lathe and check the concentricity of the body itself so I'll be clocking that up and then I'll be clocking up the bore well it's the same thing really and then I'll be putting the sleeve in and clocking up that and then we'll proceed from there. But I do notice some wear marks uh, on this and um, you notice I've also disassembled the this sort of yoke assembly. This phosphor ring, ring fits in there, over there and there's a nut that goes on the end here 
array. And um, I wasn't very happy with that. That's, this has been sort of banged around, as you can see. And I'd like to tidy that up. Um, if you notice on my previous video when this was running, the handle was slightly wobbling. I'll just show a clip of that. And I think that was due to not eccentricity. I don't think there's any eccentricity problem on here, but I think what there was, you know, the, these oil channels here were interacting with slight deformations on the ring where this has been knocked around and giving an intermittent sort of uh, action on this. And, and that's what's causing that vibration. So I'd like to true that up and clean that up. It's not just cosmetic, um, although doesn't look good. Just see if we can smooth this up, make sure there's nothing on there which is um, affecting its smooth operation. Uh, and then um, the rest is what we can do to improve concentricity. There's been a little bit of dressing in here in one place, so there must have been a ding on this, but somebody's taken care to sort that out. But the rest of it looks, looks fine. That looks like a good taper to me. Conversely, on my lathe, on the nose here this has been abused but hopefully this test will indicate how good that is okay So about a quarter of a thou, if that I would say, which I think is not bad, especially considering my L0 nose on the lathe. So there we are, that's the first test. That's uh, very reassuring. Okay, we'll refit the, the tapered sleeve. Okay, here we go again. Okay, the run out now is a little bit more. That looks to me like about seven tenths. A bit difficult to tell really, to be honest with you. But certainly more than it was. And there's actually a set screw with a little key weight. So, you know, a slight bit of, a slight amount of eccentricity in the body and a slight amount of eccentricity in the sleeve could be arranged to cancel each other out by rotating the sleeve and keying it. So here are the two keyways. They both look original to me. Well my guess is when it was when it was uh, made it would have trial assembly was done. This was rotated relative to the body. Uh, clocked up to get, be the best fit and then a couple of keys put in there let's just put this back and clock it and see if indeed they have they have keyed it at the optimal position well that actually looks a bit better to me that's closer to half a thou so I'm going to put some marks on here and then clock around and try various positions Okay, I've marked up the circumference uh, like this. So we're going to uh, rotate the sleeve and check the run out um, at these positions. And I'll note them down on here. And hopefully that will enable me to determine the optimum position for the sleeve, whether that's changed from how it was originally made. I need to bring this back to the same vertical position 
each time. So we'll put a mark on here as well. Okay, that's half a thou, but I will test each one twice. Yep, so position number one, we've got half a thou. So I'm going to go around the circumference another time and then we'll average the results out. So in the end I went around three times and I discovered there's quite a lot of variation. But a picture did emerge and that is that uh, we want the sleeve, so this red line here, to be rotated around to around about this position here. So here we are, this is the position that we need to line this up with. If we line up with existing keys that will bring the sleeve into that orientation. So that's where we want to be and that's where we currently are. So almost, as far as I'm concerned, the worst possible position. So that means that we need to rotate almost 180 degrees to there. And uh, it does seem to me you know that's the whole purpose of having this set screw and keyway to ensure that the radial position of that sleeve is pinned and uh, it optimizes um, the accumulated run out. Now there's one other consideration I think you can see that there are some track marks there uh, where the balls have slightly worn the, the track that, that tapered area and and actually there are two because there are currently two keyways so it looks to me like that's a wear feature so you could use one track and then you can change to the other keyway and use the other one I assume that's why we have two separate keyways there now what I want to do is ensure that I miss either of those tracks and uh, pick up um, a fresh portion of that tapered sleeve there so this is where our keyway is at the top here so we need to pick that up there. This is the set screw and I notice uh, on the original keyways they actually left a very generous very generous width there. I guess that's to aid assembly. So I can probably go for a range of end mills. Uh, I've got a 1 8 which probably would do it, but unfortunately this is just high speed steel. I really think for this material I'm going to need tungsten carbide, so I'm going to have to order another end mill. I might go for a slightly bigger one, somewhere between this and 1 8 and 3 16 So before proceeding with the modifications to the collet chuck, I wanted to come back and have another look at the nose taper. It actually looks worse than it is because of the reflections and the fact that I've been lightly stoning it. I would probably prefer to regrind this, uh, but I don't have a tool post grinder. Also, most probably I have to move this ring, and to remove the ring, I'd have to take the mandrel out. That would mean uh, reassembly, uh, resetting the bearings, and I don't really want to do that. So I'm just using the clock on the mandrel here, just uh, seeing if I can pick up any any high spots and um, combination of that and, and feel. You know, feel is very sensitive. You can pick up very small um, deviations. So a combination of the two hopefully will enable me to just get this taper as clean as I can get it. Let's come back here where there's more more damage. There's a dip there. But I guess I'm really looking for high spots at the moment rather than dips. That's a little bit inconclusive to be honest with you. I'm going to do a little bit more stoning on this and then I'm going to put the 
I'm going to put the collet chuck back on again and give it another go. Well, that's about the same as before. I'd say that's around about two tenths. Just try it uh, slowly under power. Well, that looks to me like about three tenths, possibly slightly more than before. Well, the reassuring thing is that the the low spot is again with the in the same position with the key at the bottom instead of measuring uh, two tenths I'm measuring about three tenths but who knows whether that's just repeatability taking it on putting it back on again anyway I'm going to assume that's as good as I'm going to get it and I'm going to proceed with my original plan of modifying that inner sleeve um, I thought actually that's not sufficient really. I also need to check that it's concentric at at least two places along this length to ensure there's no swash. So I mounted the clock up on the outside here to get a nice length that I can test across. I zeroed it here and it's reassuring that at this point it's running nice and concentric. But when I traverse towards the headstock you can see that the dial test indicator is showing a smaller reading in other words this is falling away and it's about one thou less here so that was a bit concerning when I first saw that and I assumed that that was due to run out but when I rotated the chuck in this position it was reassuring to see that actually that's also reasonably concentric too so if we come back up to here we regain that one thou, we come back to zero, and again it's concentric here. So what that means is that the axis of the collet chuck is on the axis of the lathe. So that's very very reassuring and uh, indicates that the the nose of the mandrel is is good. But what it also shows me is that this is tapered. So this is two thou larger in diameter than this end. Right, it's time to cut the keyway the new keyway in this component. This material is actually quite hard so I got a solid tungsten carbide end mill 4mm diameter. Uh, have to admit it's the first time I've ever used one of these so we'll see how that goes. I'll run that as fast as I can. I've marked out the outer extent of the keyway and the inner comes up to this shoulder. So we'll go over to the mill and see if we can cut this slot. Well that's come out well and with uh, no problems whatsoever. So I'm now working on this large diameter retaining ring which holds the bronze ring on which carries the handle and uh, this has been really messed around. It was actually quite difficult to get off and that's probably why 
the holes for the C-spanner which already chewed up. Fortunately, there was one that was tolerable there and I was able to use that. The fourth hole actually is for a set screw and that was missing, so I need to replace that. So what I need to do on this is really tidy up this face. It's got damaged here, so I'd like to get rid of that and so that means cleaning this up. But also I want to tidy up these holes. Uh, that one I'll leave, but these two, which are particularly chewed up, I'd like to uh, fill those. This is really just cosmetic, um, but uh, I think it will, I think it's worth it. So I'm going to use some um, epoxy resin. I'm going to do one as it comes. The second one I'll actually mix in some uh, fine iron filings. I just like to compare the result. It might be a useful um, technique for another job I have in mind so I could use this as a trial. So I've cleaned out the the holes with alcohol and uh, I've just been sort of abrading the inside. It's pretty hard actually uh, but uh, just to give a good a key as possible and then uh, we'll fill these holes in. It may seem strange that I'm adjusting the work at this stage, but that's because I want to make sure that the face, which is the important surface, is square with the thread. So I'm having a go at just tidying up this ring. The outside of it is really knocked around, and uh, I thought I would just uh, tidy it up, up a bit. Also, it's not very parallel, so I'm going to uh, skim that. I started this side and I'm going to reverse it and make sure it's parallel. So uh, that will just tidy things up. I'm not going to touch the bore, there's no need to touch that. Uh, I'm just going to take the minimum, the bare minimum off. You can probably hear there that the phosphor bronze has quickly knocked the edge off my high-speed steel tool. To cut the rings so that both faces were parallel, I first of all moved the ring slightly away from the chuck jaws, clocked up the ring to ensure that the run out complemented the amount which I needed to remove. And in that way, after a couple of cuts, the ring was perfectly parallel. At last we come to final assembly. I wasn't sure what lubricant to use but I finally decided on grease, certainly for the ball bearings and the sleeve, so as to minimize the chance of lubricant flying all over the place at high speeds. I'm just inserting the pin now and lining it up with the keyway in the sleeve. After tightening the pin up, I backed it off slightly just to make sure that the sleeve was free to move. Okay, before we go any further <clears throat> with that, um, we need to work on the outer sleeve. With some difficulty, I cleaned up this uh, number 10 uh, 3 16th UNF thread for a set screw which was missing. And I have uh, yeah, I put a little brass plug in there to engage on the thread for locking. So now this has been faced, uh, the outside is, is uh, tidied up. I can reassemble this and um, just adjust it for the correct play.
Well, this looks a bit Heath Robinson, I know, but um, I didn't really want to make a one-off C-spanner for this. So I've just got this little bit of uh, silver steel in there, wedged in the, the one hole I left. And uh, this is the only way I've really got of tightening this up. But it works. So this sliding ring which engages with the balls and pushes them in um, has uh, two keyways to engage with the, the key on here and um, it looks like the idea there is that you can, because they both look original, it looks like the idea is that you can have two goes at um, uh, wear and uh, so the, the two tracks show signs of wear but I think uh, this set of tracks um, in this direction seems slightly less, so we will uh, set up the keyway so that this set of tracks engages with the balls. One of those little jobs that got overlooked. But it certainly made a big difference cleaning this up. After the last video, someone recommended that I really should be using a hardened test bar. And I'm sure that's absolutely correct. However, I don't have one yet. And I'm going to use the same bar I used last time, and I think nevertheless that will give me an indication as to whether there has been an improvement. Well, after all that work, I'm getting a run out now of one thou. So there's an improvement there. I wonder what the repeatability is like. Okay, well that's one thou again. Okay, well that's less than half a thou. Interesting. That's about three quarters. So I've had one thou, one thou, less than half a thou, and about three quarters. So it's definitely an improvement. And um, yeah, so I think it's been worth doing. At least I know uh, what the chuck is capable of doing. Of course, I've only tested this now with the one collet. I really need to repeat this test with the other collets and see how I get on with those as well. <laughs> For now there's one remaining test, that's to ensure that the chuck holds securely and I'm deliberately going to leave a lot of overhang and turn a parallel section and look for surface finish and parallelism. The surface finish was acceptable and I think you can see from my using the micrometer here at both ends that it turned out bang on parallel so that was very encouraging. Okay, well that's this project finished. Um, I do hope there's been something here that's been of interest to some of you. Uh, next project, I'm going to be starting something entirely different. It's going to be looking at parting off 
and solve, solving my parting off problem on this lathe. So I do hope you'll join me for that.